On today's World Insight, trouble with cryptocurrencies losing value while under scrutiny, a bleep in the markets, or an inevitable trend. It's from cash dollars, physical money, to electronic, and that's actually a big deal in the U.S. if it happens. I'm a storyteller. And he's an accomplished lensman, both in the worlds of fashion and politics, capturing larger-than-life images. A catch-up chat with ace photographer, Laton. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin took a beating this week, losing values after weekend comments from the new U.S. Treasury Secretary and the CEO of electric car maker Tesla. Trouble began when Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said the Bitcoin was extremely insufficient, though she did say digital currencies were likely here to stay. For his part, Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeted Bitcoin and Ethereum prices were too high. Those were enough to spook markets, triggering a solo. So the question now is, is this a blip in the crypto markets or the beginning of an inevitable slide and what about that competition between Bitcoin and government-sponsored digital currencies? Let's loop in our panelists. They have their very different views. For more on digital currency, joining us in Beijing, Dr. Jay Huang, founding partner of Jstone Capital and former managing director of Intel China. In Bangkok, Jeffrey Towson, Guanghua School of Management at Peking University he is with. In New York, Anthony Chen, former J.P. Morgan Chase chief economist. Welcome, gentlemen, to the program. How shall we see the apparent enthusiasm of digital currency both in the U.S. and in China? Dr. Huang, would you like to take that first? I think they are just the digitized uh, uh, paper money. Uh, although there's a lot of uh, uh, enthusiastic and discussion about that, but fundamentally, I do not see they have any uh, uh, fundamental differences as to U.S. dollars or RMB. It's just a, a digital version of paper money. Mm. So that that's basically um, my view on that. Uh, although I could be wrong, I'm not an economist, so. I could be wrong. <laughs> Thank you for your humbleness. But uh, Mr. Chan, what's your take? Is it just a digital version of paper money, as Mr. Huang illustrated? I think of those as more of a stable currency, so you're not going to have as much uh, fluctuation uh, as you would with Bitcoin, which is very volatile. In fact, in the last uh, 24 hours, we've seen an 18% yeah. uh, volatility you would not see that under a stable uh, type of digital uh, coin. And in fact, many banks, including my uh, previous uh, employer, JP Morgan Chase, uh, uh, was uh, uh, working on a, a stable uh, currency. And the reason for that is to make transactions a lot quicker, to make uh, inter-border transactions a lot uh, uh, quicker and smoother and perhaps less, uh, less transaction costs. Right. So there is a lot of talk about digital currencies, but again, the goal is to, to try to make uh, transactions as frictionless as possible. Uh, Mr. Towson, your take. If you're talking about China, it's not a huge deal for the average user because you're already on mobile payment anyway. So it's you know clicking one button versus the other. I think that's true that it's not a huge deal um, there. But if you look at the US, we haven't seen a major shift onto mobile payment yet. US, it's really changing, not so much, you know, from mobile pay to digital UNs or digital dollars. It's from cash dollars, physical money to electronic. And that's actually a big deal in the US if it happens. Uh, it appears to be pretty slow despite the talk by various government officials. We yeah. don't see a lot of action on it. So it would probably be a bigger step up for the US than, say, China, where it's kind of normal to pay with your phone for everything anyways. Over the past year, 2020, three cities with a population about 10 to 17 million have been testing digital currency, for example, Shenzhen and several others. Meanwhile, they have been testing hypothetically in uh, 
uh, for, the, for the year 2022 during the Winter Olympic Games, uh, how digital RMB might be used uh, during that situation. Of course, it's hypothetical. But uh, Mr. Huang, so what is really behind this? Why, when China is having you know, the electronic payment so popular, still working so much on digital currency and trying to do it every step of the way? Whether behind of the mobile payment is a digital currency or it's ordinary currency, it's literally transparent to the end user. I, I do not see the end user enthusiastic about it. Mm. Here is an interesting from the central bank point of view. Yeah, please go ahead. They have their own. They may have their own um, motivation to promote and uh, the the RMB version of a digital currency. Mr. Huang, uh, how do you see the possibility that we might have a different choice, a diversity of digital version of currencies, both you know the electronic payment that has been so popular, uh, popularized by the private companies in China and a, you know, a RMB government kind of version of a digital payment. How are we going to see that potential? I personally uh, thinking all those um, central controlled digital currency, whether a controlled by the government or by central bank or by big corporation like, a, a, like a, a Facebook, for example, uh, I, I think they are the, the same. I do not see fundamental differences. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, but the Bitcoin is fundamentally different. Yeah. It's not centralized controlled. So if you're really thinking of a digital currency as something to be excited about, I can only think about this a non-centralized centralized control currency. Yeah. Currently, the big one is the Bitcoin. Ms. Yellen, uh, in her latest remarks regarding Bitcoin, she's been talking, warning the public about, you know, the use of it in money laundering and illegal uh, 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 cases uh, rather than its popularity already in the world. On the other hand, uh, she has also been warning of the extra energy that has been wasted as a result of using Bitcoin compared to other types of digital currency. So, Mr. Chen, would you help us to understand how, how do you see this debate inside the U.S. as well? The central banks uh, here in the United States, as I said, uh, feel that Bitcoin is competition and therefore they're not going to be big cheerleaders of uh, Bitcoin. And so the best way uh, to counteract the, the popularity of Bitcoin is to create a currency itself that, uh, that is similar to Bitcoin. With regard to the energy, yes, uh, Bitcoin uses a lot of energy. Uh, and in fact, some people have made the uh, comparison that uh, Bitcoin uses more energy than the entire electricity consumption in Argentina. However, if you look at all the appliances in the United States that are not being in use, but they're plugged in, they also consume energy, and that energy is equivalent to all the energy that Bitcoin uses. So, yeah, you can make all these comparisons, mm -hmm. but I think at the end of the day is that these currencies like Bitcoin represent real competition because it's decentralized and they have no control over it, and yeah. therefore they want to come up with something that they have much better control over. Mr. Towson, help us to understand your perspective in this regard. This competition, apparently very interesting. Bitcoin, what it is very good at is speculation, mm -hmm. and it's pretty good, or at least it appears to be an alternate place to store your wealth. And that's, I think, what a lot of people are doing, which has arguably been heightened in the last year as the U.S. Treasury in particular has lost all sense of let's just not print money left and right and effectively devalue everyone's dollars. What are they going to do? Mm. Well. Now we know what they're going to do. They're going to shift their money into Bitcoin and protect themselves from inflation. So that's a problem for the U.S. Treasury. And mm. it is some much needed competition to what I would consider a lack of financial discipline. We see some very interesting things. There are several layers of it, it seems, from your earlier conversation. One is the competition between 
the government or at least the uh, uh, the money authority of uh, various governments and also the private sector as well as individuals for example behind Bitcoin secondly we have also seen this apparent competition among countries among uh, central bankers about uh, digital currencies of their own uh, country and vis-a-vis -vis one another uh, for example digital RMB digital US dollar and the list can go on and meanwhile we have also seen uh, the public both enthusiasm about all these different versions of uh, money but at the same time the issue of privacy as well as we know their uh, electronic payment for example there has been a lot of issues about privacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, what is uh, 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 information that needs to be shared in order to guarantee the secu secu uh, security situation. So there are a lot of layers of this discussion. Uh, Dr. Huang, come in here. To you, which one is the most crucial? I personally think that the, and the Bitcoin has come a long way. And I, I personally believe it's continued going down mm -hmm. and maybe become a, an alternative and to gold or to U.S. dollars. Especially, uh, as Jeff said, the people uh, lose trust on the, uh, the U.S. government, the self-control on printing money. Mm. We see this uh, incentive plan, you know, it's an initiative, and then a few trillion dollars uh, today, next week another few trillion dollars, and then, you know, coming up. This speed of uh, printing out money really mm. get the people and scared and lose their trust on the U.S. dollars. So I, I think that the Bitcoin, Miss Yellen didn't say, maybe she, she do not want to say is, as, as Jeff said, what if a Bitcoin become an alternative to the U.S. dollars? And then what that impact to the U.S. dollars and the unique position? Do you see uh, the, the roadmap that long from here, uh, Mr. Huang, since you asked that question? No, uh, actually, and uh, uh, I buying the uh, Cassie Wood and uh, an ARK investment argument, and the sh and they think and the, this wave of Bitcoin enthusiastic primarily driven by big institutional and asset allocation. Mm. Uh, they claim uh, if big institutions started to uh, diversify their asset allocation depending on how much money they put in, even smaller percentage, so less than 10%, it could drive Bitcoin to 400,000 to 500,000 US dollar per coin level. You know, the Bitcoin thing has become so volatile. It's 18% over the past week as a result of remarks coming from Secretary Yellen, uh, to say the least. Um, so how, how, how are investors going to look at that, including institutional investors? Well, I think that the correct way to look at uh, an asset class like Bitcoin is to acknowledge that it's uh, very volatile uh, and also to acknowledge that if you're going to invest, you have to invest uh, funds that you want to save for long periods of time and only a small portion of your portfolio uh, that would be categorized as being very, very risky. Uh, longer term, I think that the prospects for Bitcoin are very favorable, but anytime you see fluctuations uh, uh, as large as 18% in a single day, you have to be nervous. I still remember in 2017 mm -hmm. that Bitcoin had a great year, and yet the year after, uh, Bitcoin uh, values went down by 80%. So even the big proponents, the big institutional uh, houses uh, on Wall Street are are saying that you should only allocate as an investor something uh, in the neighborhood of about one to three percent of your portfolio towards uh, Bitcoin. If you do that, I think you'll be fine. But if you put a bigger percentage of that, then I think you'll be very nervous uh, by the volatility in this asset class. And that's likely to continue, isn't it, uh, Mr. Chen? I mean, you know. Secretary Yellen could say something today and she could say something other days. Other central bankers could also have a different view. Uh, governments could come out, uh, international uh, institutions of governments could also speak out about that issue. So that would make the picture continues to be volatile, uh, likely. So um, is it fair? Is it a reality that every investor has to face right now? 
I think you have to face the reality that there's going to be volatility in this asset class. And it is yeah. not just Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. In fact, this week, uh, we also heard uh, some comments from someone that has a vested interest in seeing Bitcoin go up, namely uh, the head of uh, Tesla, mm -hmm. Elon Musk himself, saying that the valley was a little bit higher, despite the fact that he was talking against his book because he has one and a half billion dollars invested. And so the price obviously went down. So you're going to, investors have to realize that a lot of this talk is going to be noise, but the long term prospects, in my judgment, are still very favorable for Bitcoin. But you have to have volatility. But you know, what about this? Uh you all talk about the U.S. dollar and uh, the current situation of uh, printing U.S. dollar to solve the problems inside the United States. So Bitcoin is one of those uh, phenomena that's likely to challenge the future of U.S. dollar. But many wonder uh, whether that will be a revolutionary possibility or are we going to see, uh, you know, the fact that it's not being controlled by central bank of the United States, but it's being controlled by some other in individuals or institutions likely in the near future? Uh, Mr. Huang, help us to understand that. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, this is a great question. I, I personally think it's going to be revolutionary. So far, there are over 20 um, petition to get a Bitcoin ETF set up in the United States, a stock exchange market, all get shut down. Now uh, in Canada, the Canadian regulator approved, already approved the two Bitcoin ETF. And the Australia government is already on the process of approving another one. And I, I expect to see and a lot of uh, and, uh, government and uh, started to recognize the importance and, and also diversification aspect of the Bitcoin, started to legalize and then the Bitcoin. I think the next step, and uh, you know, I would guess the US government is coming to, uh, and the regulator is coming to embracing it instead of an oppose it. And especially if I were the central bank of China, I would be the first one to champion and embrace and uh, um, the Bitcoin because this is the only way, only feasible way to break up and the U.S. dollar monopoly in international transactions. You know, any strategic thinker and the sovereign nation, if you do not like it to be controlled by the U.S. financial and institution, should consider Bitcoin as a, uh, alternative. But, but, but you said yourself, Mr. Huang, that at this moment, the security issues related to Bitcoin is not solved. No, no, no. I, I don't think that the security has any issue and with Bitcoin. And uh, I think that Ms. Yellen says that the issue is the criminals are yes, using taking advantage of Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, I would say, okay, before Bitcoin come to the world, which currency criminals are using the most even today, which currency and the criminal are, are used the most? It's not Bitcoin. And then I think that- uh, What I agree is it with then? Mr. Maybe you that, need to give us the answer. Oh, of course the US dollars, right? Everybody knows it. <laughs> okay, you need to say uh, it. You, you cannot shut down a currency because then the criminals are using it, right? You never do that. I agree with 100%, Mr. Chen said, it's all about allocation. And it's not, it's not wise and that you allocate a huge chunk of your asset into Bitcoin. However, even a very small portion of the allocation is going to jack up the Bitcoin price. Mm. And the ARC did that calculation. They said for standard and poor and 500 companies, if they allocate 1% of their cash on Bitcoin, it's going to jack up the price by 40,000 US dollars. Right. Are you going to be as much a cheerleader as Dr. Huang, Mr. Towson, about Bitcoin? I mean, it's a new animal. It's, um, it's not just 
fiat currency backed by the government and private currency, which you could argue gold is a type of private currency. And so we've seen that dynamic for a long time. Do you hold gold or do you hold dollars? Uh, but this is even different than that because nobody controls Bitcoin. It is decentralized with a fixed volume um, by definition. So it's a technological digital form of gold, if anything else. And now we've never seen anything like this. This is a new thing. Um, so there's going to be a lot of surprises along the way. I, I generally agree with the portfolio approach. I think it's a nice addition to the situation and it might be the right technology at the right moment, mm -hmm. given particularly the US government's printing spree you know, this has come along at the right moment where people are thinking about, look, my bank account is getting worth less and less every day because of what they're doing in D.C. Yeah. Uh, let's put some money over here. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a technology of the moment at the right time. Yeah. Mr. Chen, your take that apparent competition between Bitcoin and what uh, uh, Secretary Yellen might believe as the best solution. I think that in the end, uh, Bitcoin will win, and I'll so, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, as you all know, the supply of Bitcoin is limited, and as you start to see more people and more institutions uh, demanding Bitcoin, you don't have to be an economist to figure out that if the supply is fixed but the demand continues to increase over time, there's only one thing that can happen to the price, and that is the price goes higher and higher. Yeah. So that is why, over the long term. Uh, the price of Bitcoin will continue to go higher. In fact, if you look at Bitcoin wallets today, uh, it's still not democratized. Uh, Two percent of the wallets of Bitcoin is estimated to hold as much as 90 percent or more of all the Bitcoin out there. To the extent that that continues to expand over time, it's okay. going to put even further upward pressure on prices. Anthony Chen, Jeffrey Townsend, last but not least, Jay Huang, thank you so much. It's an interesting conversation. Let's see what's going to happen, possibly very soon. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Still to come in the program, he's an accomplished lensman, both in the world of fashion and politics, capturing larger-than-life images. A catch-up chat with ace photographer Platten. Next. Welcome back. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Now let's turn to photography. The Lensman Platten has been a creative force through his prolific vivid pictures. He has captured portraits of the most famous and powerful people on the planet, Bill Clinton, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, and many others. How does he tear down the personal barriers his subjects put up in front of the camera? Earlier, I had the chance to catch up with him, and we talked about taking pictures of big names and how to make photography authentic. Take a listen. For more, joining us from New York, a Platon, a photographer, human rights activist, and a storyteller. What a pleasure to see you. It's great to see you too. You know, this is the guy behind the scenes taking photo of everyone, all those important moments. But now we can see you, the guy behind the scenes. That's really something. I'm a storyteller and I care deeply about, uh, at this time of global division, I care deeply about people coming together, working together, connecting and bridge building. And, and I think as we rebuild the new world, I think we have to rebuild with a different mindset. And so if I can use stories to bring people back together, then I'm happy to be in front of the camera temporarily. I thought I was just talking to a photographer. Apparently it's not. It's someone <laughs> who has been thinking about where we are a lot. I'm very impressed, Platon. Tell me more well, about some of the latest photos you did. You know, he, here's the thing. Um, we were all moving so fast mm -hmm. before. Most of us were not spending enough time with our loved ones or our family because we were distracted by technology. I've seen people at dinner on a date and they're both on their cell phones texting other people while they're in front of each other. Yeah. Um, this is what was happening to society. COVID has, has given the world an opportunity to reset and obviously it's been 
a horrific experience for so many people around the world and for those people who have lost loved ones yeah i mean it's the tragedy of history um but it's also given us a chance to rethink about all the things that we were doing wrong before and it's giving us an opportunity to correct as we move forward mm. and and i and for me this has given me an opportunity to stop pause reflect and it helps me move forward next year because if you never get a chance to reflect then you're never really on top of your creative output you're just riding a wave so it's really important that we stop and think and uh, we talk to ourselves yes. and we say you know how can i rank myself how can i measure my contribution to the world and was it really all about success um, money fame validation mm -hmm. or is it possible that we could rethink about what success is and think of ourselves as servants of society for me success is being able to bridge uh, to, to create a bridge between people that didn't really communicate. Right. If, if, you could, if I can use my work to bring people together, and m even more importantly than that, to amplify voices that have been previously unheard, I think that's really important. I photographed the most powerful people in the world, and I became known as the photographer of power. Mm -hmm. I think they tell me that I photographed more world leaders than anyone in history in a private sitting. Um, so I've seen it up close and, and very personal. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like going to the dentist. You know, you, you, it's intimate. You know, I was an inch and a half away from Putin's nose as I focused my camera. Mm -hmm. So you feel his breath on your hand when you're working in that intimate way and you right. get close to someone. Um, but I've also had the great privilege in life to photograph people who have been robbed of power and people who care deeply about human rights and people who have made great sacrifices for the sake of others mm -hmm. and so i've seen both sides of the spectrum yeah and it's a it's a very strange perspective to have you know to, yeah. to be able to go to the top of the power pyramid right and then go all the way to the people who have not been heard at the base. Yeah. So it's a it's a great privilege to have that perspective. I, I love that idea. You know, over the years, some of the works that artists might be most proud of at the moment they made it may not necessarily the works that would always meandering in their mind years later. It really depends on where they are, what their stage of life is, and how the world has been changing. Is that true also for you, Platon? I know you've been doing enormous amount of work. What you said is actually very true. You can take, I can take a picture. Picture stays the same, but history changes around it. I love that. I can't change anything. And I, I don't want to make you think that the person I photographed is a good person or a bad person. Mm. My job is not to judge. My job is to capture. Yes. It's for society and it's actually for history to judge. It's their legacy that will tell us whether they did good or bad. Mm. So I'm powerless in that, and I have no interest in that. If I can capture someone's spirit in that 500th of a second, um, then it's, it's there for society. It's there to cure society's amnesia, to remind society that this person was there, and this is what they were like. In the media today, everyone is fascinated by making judgments. Mm. And I never wanted to do that. You know, I've been briefed by so many editors in the past when they would say, you're about to photograph this young politician. We really like that guy, so mm -hmm. make him smile. And I would always say, you know what? <laughs> that might not be the person I meet. Yeah, you know, he exactly. might not be in a good mood. And so I always try to be true um, to the moment. And at the time, it might not fit with everyone's idea of um, the, the media persona yeah. of that person. But it's quite extraordinary how many times I caught a true moment and 
20 years later or 10 years later, we look back at history mm. and that moment really means something and you can see it. This is what um, I want so, to learn, Platon. I mean, journalism, uh, you know, people do work like me. I want to learn some secrets from you. You know, how would you bring that moment out? What are some of is, your secret weapons? There is a, there's a magic, <laughs> it's not a trick and I wish there was a trick. Yeah. And I wish there was a gimmick, but there is no gimmick. The truth is about being honest and sincere and authentic. Because we all constantly, especially when we're in a professional environment, uh, we all put on an act. We all have a business card that says we're a bit more powerful than we are actually in mm -hmm. real life. And we all have social media accounts where we try to pretend we're actually cooler than we really are. Mm -hmm. And we all secretly want validation. Um, that's, that's, that's the currency of society. But um, the honest truth is that when you're with someone, you can't allow power to ever intimidate you. I always have a healthy disregard for power. I'm not disrespectful when I work with anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I treat everyone the same, whether it's the president of Russia or whether it's a homeless person in New York. Now, if you can dare to be authentic with people, it takes a bit of courage because we're all scared to tell the truth. But if you dare to tell the truth, it sets the most magical tone of mm -hmm. honesty between you and your sitter. Yeah. I'm just looking to capture them at a quiet moment of authenticity. Mm. When someone is 150% themselves, if I can get to that magical moment, then message delivered and understood. Platon, if I ask you, you know, after photographing, almost everyone so-called in the high political office and the so-called dignitaries of the world. What is on your desired list? I have, a, I have not had an opportunity to photograph Queen Elizabeth II. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told by the palace I'm on the list, but I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> but, Good luck, you, you know, got my vote. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, the, the interesting thing is, when I was younger, I used to think, okay, the powerful people are over there. If I can go over there, uh, I'll be in with the powerful people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that will give me some kind of validation. Um, but as time went on, I started to realize that, and this is a message to everybody, it's, it's not just a conversation between you and me, that you have to live a life that is 200% alive. In other words, every second of a, your life, you have to believe that where you are and what you're doing is really significant. Mm. And if you invest all your creative and your human um, emotions into that, into that split moment, whether you're with your family or whether you're with your business colleagues or friends, or whether, you know, like if I've, I'm working with a president or a homeless person, yeah. I invest everything in that moment. And here's the strange thing. When you do that, it becomes significant. Mm. So after a while, I realized it's not over there where the powerful people are, where I need to be to be validated. Yes. Wherever I am, if I believe in the moment, it will become a moment. And I've proved that to myself many times that I photographed so many people who are not famous, who are not powerful. But if I yeah. invest my energies into that moment with that person and treat them with the, with the respect and the dignity that they really deserve, that moment can become much more historic than if I'm working with a world leader. Yeah, tell me because one or two of those in, moments. In... Um, in America for years, this is not just talking about Donald Trump, this is before Trump. We've had a huge problem with immigration and our immigration laws. Yeah. And uh, it's caused a lot of cultural friction as well as political friction in our country. So um, I thought it would be interesting during Obama's presidency to try and investigate the human side of uh, the immigration problems mm -hmm. 
And one day I was at a march. Uh, 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 it was a pro-immigration reform march. So mm -hmm. people were marching to change the broken law. Right. Uh, and there was this mother marching with her little girl, whose, whose name was Evelyn, and she was about three years old. And they, uh, Evelyn was a citizen. Her mother was a citizen, mm -hmm. but Evelyn's father was not a citizen. He was caught by the local authorities without the proper paperwork, and he was uh, put in a detention center awaiting deportation. So Evelyn's family had been torn apart because of uh, 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 an immigration law. I see. So, um, and it raises a complicated issue of um, uh, the moral law and the, the, the you know, the, the legal uh, uh, rules that mm -hmm. we have to follow. And they don't always connect. So the little girl had a t-shirt that said, free my dad on it, that she'd hand drawn with letters. And I thought it was very powerful as a picture so I went up to the mother and I said, do you mind if I photograph your little girl? Because I think her T-shirt is a very powerful statement. The mother said, sure. I pointed my camera at the little girl mm -hmm. and she did what my kids would have done. She got frightened. Who is this strange man? So she hid behind her mother's legs. Oh. Now, that's not the picture I wanted to take of a frightened little girl. I wanted to photograph the girl I'd seen on the march, marching with a sense of optimism right and hope that her father will be released so um to earn the little girl's trust i had to play balloons with her for five and a half hours she pointed to me after all that time and she said picture oh. so after i took the picture i turned to the mother and i said i think i've just taken one of the most important pictures of my life because with this picture i can restart a dignified conversation about immigration Mm. that no one's ever had. So the mother turns to a little girl and the mother says, the photographer's very happy, you did good, I'm very proud of you. Mm -hmm. And the little girl turns around to her mother and she says, mommy, if I did so good, does that mean daddy can come home? Wow, tears in Now eyes. I've told that story to many people in power mm. and it did start a discussion in America mm. that was not just about politics yeah. and law, but about humanity. Yeah. And it made everybody think for a moment that I'm not, I'm not putting forward a political agenda ever in my work, mm -hmm. but it, I do care that we humanize the data so that this is not about numbers or statistics, even though it's based on fact. Yeah. What this is about is that this is a human being and all those numbers and statistics that everyone quotes all the time they're all human beings with relationships and families just like our own. Mm -hmm. And if I can help create empathy in the world by humanizing the data, then I can help begin the process of bringing people back together yeah. because they all start to realize that that little girl could be their little girl. You know, Platon, I know where you are, America is struggling with so much with this domestic agenda because there are questions handed over through generations that have not been resolved and exploded. Would it be still possible for political leaders in that country to open up their hearts and look at the other questions that others have? You have politicians who think that winning means that someone else has to lose. It's not really a win if half the country lost. And right now, Trump's supporters, they've been sort of erased, right? You have absence. But absence does not mean that those feelings have gone away. No. It just means that their, their, their voices have been silenced. And when you, have, when you have unrest and when you have uh, confusion and fear, I don't think it's the right thing to do to push a uh, healthy debate aside. I think you have to open up forums of discussion, not shut right. them down. Meanwhile, the people who really want their voices heard, the people who are struggling, who are falling into the COVID crater, the mm -hmm. poor people, they're not getting listened to. So uh, it's a huge battle right now in society with the people who have a voice and I think they're abusing their voice. Before we go, I got one thing to catch up with.
Sure. Can you help me? How can I pose in front of Zoom with style? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. It's a combination. This thing. is this is a big challenge. You know, I've been thinking about it for a whole year, and will I get the answer? All right. It's very simple. Okay. The lighting is really important. <laughs> the lighting should always be central and slightly above, so it carves out cheekbones, creates shadows. It's where you want them. The the other thing is you have to think of this. Uh, again, I'm going to strip it down to humanity. When you are out with a dear friend、yeah. and you're having dinner with them,、mm-hmm. right? And you have a, you're sitting opposite each other at、yes. a table.、Mm-hmm. If your friend is saying something really interesting, inspiring, and you're in, you're happy, you're probably going to lean in. Yeah. And you're going to really, with your feelings, want to reach out to that person. Now、okay. that is a sign that you are filled with admiration, humility, and respect, and it brings out the best in you. But if you are nervous, anxious, protective, guarded, you're not going to lean forward. You're going to retreat. Yes. You might even fold your arms. Fold my arms. You, you will become closed instead of out and open. Yeah. So you have to think of the camera in Zoom. As your best friend, yes, and you have to be courageous with the open hand of friendship. Philosophically, I'm speaking. So you have to reach out, and it makes no difference whether it's a person or a camera, because beyond that camera are people. Yeah. So you have to always reach out with the open hand of friendship. Create a bridge between yourself and the people, whether they are really with you or through this technology. Either way,、okay. we have to bridge build and come together. That is a really interesting conversation. That's all we have for today's program. If you like to see more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.